big thanks to Insta360 for supporting this video. I've been using the tiny GoTo cameras for all of my onboard footage for a couple of years now. And now I've got the new 360X3 camera, which was used for the onboards in this video, but more on that later because the specs are seriously impressive. Hi everyone, good morning. I'm out on rim brake Betty, but I'm testing the integrated aero handlebar from Fastwalks, the new one. I'm just out getting warmed up get used to the position. I'm gonna do a couple of baselines on the, the old handlebar. I've shied away from getting an aero handlebar for ages because I've always had a problem with the shape of the drops. Um, they're obviously fixed. You can't change the pitch on a one piece bar and stem. But I think the fast sports one is, along with the S-Works Aerofly one, it's kind of the sweet spot. The drops are nice and flat and parallel to the ground. They're horizontal. We're gonna swap it over do a couple of runs on each, get the CDA to converge. I thought the round bar might be a bit better to kind of pre-trip the flow before it hits the right and the legs, because obviously uh, we're not just racing handlebars, we're racing the whole system. And uh, if you can slow down some of the free stream velocity before it hits the rider, is that gonna be a total drag saving that's better than having a smooth aerofoil section? A couple of years ago, I was actually bored enough to do some CFD trials on a round bar versus an aero bar, and I was keen to kind of see whether there's actually a system improvement by having a road bar because of this kind of pre-tripping and pre-slowing down the air before it hit the rider. So what you can see in this plot here is a contour plot of pressure, but the actual volume that you're seeing is everything in the model that is going less or having less airspeed than 17 kilometers an hour, and the free stream velocity is 40 kilometers an hour. So the velocity from the right-hand side of the screen coming onto the rider is 40 kilometers an hour. But everything you can see in a 3D model has been slowed to less than 17 kilometers an hour. And you can see behind the handlebar, all of this volume here, all of this wake behind the handlebar is going slower than 17 kilometers an hour. So it's been slowed down before it's hitting the rider's legs, as you can see here. I mean, there's a bit through the middle which hasn't slowed down to that extent. But I just picked 17 because it shows, you know, the contour where it's just hitting the rider. Now, if we take exactly the same volume of 17 kilometers an hour on the error bar model, nothing has been slowed down to that extent. You know, all of the air behind the handlebar here is going faster, apart from this bit by the wrist, is going faster than 17 kilometers an hour. So when it's gonna hit the rider, it's not slowed down and will potentially cause more of a drag and a larger wake behind the rider's legs because it hasn't been slowed down. So is that gonna be better or is it gonna be better to do the kind of tripping case well, these CFD plots actually showed that despite this, not slowing the air behind the handlebar down, the aero bar was actually faster than the round bar. But I was always skeptical, so now finally I've got my hands on one with it in a shape that I like. Um, I can put these hours of CFD behind me and actually validate this, because the CFD did say that the aero bar was faster. So before we get back to the testing, let's have a quick look at the handlebar itself. And they come with a load of different uh, computer mounts. This is a Garmin one, it comes with Wahoo, it comes with Brighton one. And it also comes with a kind of GoPro style mount for the bottom of that mount. Now, this mount is something quite special. It's really, really nicely made. It's kind of a carbon infused nylon. Um, a lot of other companies would market that fact um, and call it some sort of matrix infused copolymer carbon. It's actually just plastic. Um, fast sports don't shout about it, but a lot of the companies would. I'm looking at you, Magura. Um, this is just a carbon, a chopped carbon reinforced plastic mount, but you know, it's really nicely made. The tooling for that alone is, is something quite, you know, expensive and they've invested in that and they've done it really, really well. The finish on it is, is marvellous and the way it mounts the bar is really, really nice and you don't have to run it either. Obviously there's integrated routing through the whole thing. I'm not going to be using that because I'm going to do a quick test on the rim brake bike first. It'll be a lot easier to set up kind of out the back of the car. Um, and do back-to-back -back tests because obviously back-to-back -back tests is important to make sure we get the same weather, same rolling resistance on that day, same width, same length as the current setup. So we'll see if it makes it any faster. But the finish, the engineering finish on this, as good as any other carbon bar I've seen. Well, the max bending moment on the bar is here and here, but I imagine the highest stress point is, is here because it's necked and it's thin um, and you've got torsion from the drops when you're riding in the drops. And, you know, there's this bit of a stress concentrator here and that's where they put the hole. That's where they need the hole. The hole does need to be there if they're going to route the cables there. But I assume they've done the, uh, the stress analysis and the structural analysis properly. But in total, it's just a really well-made thing.
Before we get into the data, I wanna thank the channel sponsor, Insta360. In this video, I was using the new X3 camera, which features two large half inch sensors for seamless 360 degree framing. For cycling, what's cool is you can set the camera in pretty much any orientation and select your framing afterwards, so you don't need to worry about the perfect adjustment before those sketchy runs. Footage is captured up to 5.7K resolution, and it also features a single lens mode that beats any other action camera out there with a 170 degree max view angle. And now you can also shoot in a fixed angle single lens mode at 4K if you just want to point and shoot final videos with no reframing. For these shots, I use a simple lightweight carbon boom mounted to the bars, which is strangely invisible. To give you an idea, YouTube compresses video bit rates to about 10 megabits per second, but this camera outputs up to 120 megabits per second. Anyway, all the links in the description, but I'll mention it at the end as well. 360 framing can all be handled manually or by the app AI, phone or PC based. So the output possibilities from one clip are almost endless. Now, unfortunately, I'm not sure we can directly compare the results to the disc brake bike just yet because I am using a different power meter. I'm using the Favero pedals. In previous videos, and you've seen the data, I have baselined those to the cork that I'm using on the disc brake bike to within 1%. So we could compare the results, but for now I'm gonna be setting a different baseline just for the rim brake bike. Um, I do expect it to be a lot faster. I'm running 25s. I've got narrower rims. Well, bloody hell, the things I do for TV, that's the bar fitted with the world's worst bar tape job. It was literally falling apart in my hands. You can see it was just getting shredded. Um, but we got there in the end. Every single five lap test, error bar had a lower CDA than the round bar. Simple as that. Okay, we can see the trend lines are not completely flat, but they are consistent moving on what does that mean in terms of the magical marketing speed of 40 kilometers an hour pretty good five and a half watts quicker at 40 k's an hour now in the previous video i rode at about 35 k's an hour but i was riding an average of around 40 k's an hour and that's indicated by that pink line on the graph now we can extrapolate up using the power drag equation to 50 k's an hour and then down to 30 k's an hour but even at 30 k's an hour there's a small benefit around 2.3 watts and that's a predicted value not a measured value because like i said the measured values the empirical values were at just under 40 k's an hour you might not think that's a big enough change to warrant purchasing an error bar and i would say be careful because the likelihood is of you actually getting a gain is very slim if you don't know your bike fit is perfect now i've been through many aero tests and bike fits and i've done quite a lot of racing to know that i'm pretty happy with my stack and reach so if i can match my stack and reach on an aero bar to my current setup then i know it's going to be faster Whereas if you're just picking one kind of pie in the sky and you don't know your bike fit is optimal, be very, very careful. Second point, my CDA, looking back at this graph, is quite high because I'm 1.95 meters tall. My frontal area is pretty big. So the proportion benefit from going to an aero bar for me is quite small. But if you're a smaller rider, that percentage benefit on your CDA is going to be much, much bigger because your CDA is going to be lower to start with. You're going to get the same probably around the same CDA difference as I did at 0.007, and that's gonna be a bigger percentage of your starting CDA. So if you're a small rider and you're at the top of your game, bike component choices and aerodynamics of the bike and the bike parts do become really important, particularly the bars and the wheels and the things at the front end of the bike if you're a smaller rider. Now, before we go any further into some more nitty gritty stuff, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps the channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon because that helps the channel in ways I simply don't understand, but just do it anyway. It's important to criticize the test method and the equipment as well. Now you can see here that throughout one test, this is about 20 minutes worth of riding, density does tend to tend upwards slightly. Kind of the inverse of that is temperature. And these two things are measured on board and they're almost exact mirrors of each other. And it looks like the temperature is decreasing and that we get these little kind of uptrends in, in, the, in the trend as well. And what I put this down to, self-heating of the electronics and self-cooling tends asymptotically and it does level off and this this sensor in the software works on cda convergence so it waits until the kind of cda estimation has converged before it gives you a valid result we need to wait until these things have sort of leveled off which they have done after four laps here and then we do a fifth lap to kind of double check that but why is this thing drifting and why is the temperature drifting down and the density drifting up? Well, like I said, you would normally expect that because they are basically inverse of each other. Now, I've plotted along the bottom for the same sample numbers. 
my heading. This is uh, a magnetic reading of my heading. This is basically due north and then due south. So you can see every time I turn, you know, we get a slight bit of heating and then we get more cooling and then we get a slight bit of heating and a slight bit of cooling. And what I think is happening is throughout the run, I think the wind cooling effect, and this day was pretty cold, it was about six, seven degrees. The wind is cooling the electronics. And then when I turn round, that airflow of the sensor is stopping. So the electronics kind of self heat a little bit. And as soon as I get going again, bang, they start to get cooler. Going north leg, the temperature drop is much higher or much faster. And I think that's because I'm also putting the sensor in my body shadow. On the way back, I still get the air cooling, so it gets colder, but it's also in the sunlight. So <laughs> the temperature reduction is slightly less. I've just come up with this theory. I think that's what's going on. I think it's kind of air cooling of the unit. Moving on from that, if you're interested in the camera, the X3, which I shot a lot of this video on, the Insta360 X3 links are in the description. There's a Black Friday promo ending very soon, so check that link out below. It certainly made filming this test a bit more fun and showing you that roadside bar change. Also, there are non-Black Friday links to all the cameras, including my go-to riding camera, the Go2, which is genuinely no pun intended. That's pretty much my favorite little mini action camera. And also there's a cheeky discount code for the Fast Sports Bar as well. You know I've been holding off for this one and I definitely now approve of it. Uh, just because it fits me and I like the construction. But make sure you're confident in your bike fit first before you go to the aero bar because there's no adjustment at all apart from hoods. Cheers and I'll see you in the next one.